Hey everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rick Ritchie and we are doing a live NASM webinar and I've got today uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, and somebody very educated and apt to talk to us about the subject today. Today we're going to talk about foam rolling, uh, this self-myofascial rolling, the techniques, what it is, what it does, how it works, what are the outcomes. And so I am joined today with uh, Kyle Stoll, and literally, I, he is the guy who wrote the book. He wrote the book on foam rolling, so who better else to have than our NASM colleague, uh, Dr. Kyle Stoll. How you doing, man? Thank you very much, Rick. I'm, I'm doing very well. Um, how about you? I, as well as I can be, I gotta be honest, I'm, I'm really looking forward to some normalcy, um, but I'm getting ready and uh, you know acclimated pretty well to the new normal. And uh, we'll see. We'll see. What about you? Um, uh, we're doing well. You know, here here in Austin, we're north of Austin, so I uh, don't quite have the same. I guess in my 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 mind, we don't quite have the same type of restrictions you guys may may have. Uh, we're still able to get out just a little bit, but uh, you know we're doing all right, hanging in there. Most of the stuff I do is is online anyway, so it hasn't been a huge shift in my work. Uh, but you know we're doing well. Excellent. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, we got a lot of people are taking this time to um, you know professional development, personal development, uh, education. That they've got the time to spend to do it, and that's really why NASM started offering these um, educational uh, content, these live courses. So thank you so much for participating and being a part of it. And we're looking forward to bringing more to you because we want to help support people during this time uh, and with this process. So um, I think if there's any education company that's out there that works with personal trainers that you would associate with foam rolling, then NASM would be the one. And years ago, when I first started as a trainer, um, people that were foam rolling were the weird people in the gym that had these, these pool noodles that were on the floor and they were rolling around on them. And it was kind of a, uh, an odd, uh, nonsensical thing that people were doing and it's really shifted mainstream. Can you just kind of talk us through the the start of it and how it how it started to develop and some of the shifts that took place in the mindsets of the the greater population that started accepting the benefits of foam rolling and with that we can start getting into what are the benefits of it. Yeah, for sure. At least I will. I will describe it uh, the way I under understand it. Um, so foam rolling is really just based off of massage, as as you know, as a therapist, and as as not, I know as a as a therapist. There's a ton of benefits to massage, but oftentimes uh, massage was one of those things that not everyone had access to on a regular basis. Either they just didn't have a therapist uh, readily available, or it beca became or it is expensive. So if we just take that and and uh, it, that just well, let me back up a little bit. Oftentimes, therapists would use similar types of devices in treatment sessions. So we've seen a lot of different things over the years with you know types of handheld rollers that therapists may use, or uh, I've seen stories of therapists giving their clients like rolling pins. Or this one this one uh, physical therapist I met many years ago, she used to cut off wooden table legs of those those contoured uh, like dinner tables. And she would cut those up. <laughs> she would cut those up and give them to her clients to go home and try to roll on and try to maintain maintain some of the changes in tissue that she was making in their their treatment sessions. So it really just based on my my knowledge, it came from there. And I think it really grew in popularity whenever we started seeing more uh, sports professionals, sports players, other types of professionals using these types of devices, uh, rollers or, you know, other types of more technical, uh, technologically advanced devices. We started seeing that more on the sidelines and at games and uh, other places there. And that's really where I think it started to become less, less of a weird thing because, you know, 
you know, better than anybody, as soon as a top level athlete is seen doing something, it all of a sudden becomes the cool thing to do. So I think that's what made it a little less weird. And one of the other big things I think in in popularity is whenever we have companies such as NASM promoting it and uh, Trigger Point, who I worked for, worked with for many years, they kind of took it to the next level and started making rollers that actually looked cool and putting some education behind it and then it started to make more sense to everyone gotcha well they definitely made them uh look cool i think at the time we had the option for um I, it was uh, the white or the black uh pool <laughs> and, yeah. like and that, that was about it we were limited on it and they they came out with a lot of good products and they were very cool nasm's long been a proponent of of this foam rolling or historically, as we've called self myofascial release, can you give us some insight as to the, the change in nomenclature? So we're not actually using that terminology release anymore. Can you speak to that? So there has been, or my research colleague and I, Dr. Scott Cheatham, um, we've We've suggested a change in the in the language that we use, moving away from release more to just rolling, and it's really based on the the techniques and the application. So if we look at myofascial release, it is you know typically done by a, a therapist that's trained in myofascial release, and it's a very specific technique where they're you know more often than not they're going to use their hands, they're going to find restriction in tissue, and then they're going to apply pressure, uh, you know, can last anywhere from two to up to five minutes until they start to feel change in the tissue. And then they typically will apply more pressure, again, trying to get a, you know, subsequent release. So that's going to be myofascial release. Whenever we look at our applications with a foam roller, people don't don't really do that. They do more of just the the rolling across it, hence the, the name self myofascial rolling or foam rolling. And now if they're following a, a, a recommended technique by NASM and others, they would still try to find a tender spot and hold pressure. However, the research that we have so far, it doesn't really support that it's releasing fascia. It may be or it may not be. So that's kind of the, the change over is we, maybe we are releasing fascia. We just don't have the evidence right now to support it. So we're just kind of going to go with this other term, the, the self myofascial rolling, because we do have more evidence to support the benefits of, of the rolling aspect, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So can you talk us through what some of the benefits are? And then you also mentioned we are looking for tender points. Can you talk us through why that is and what that means and why do I have to go to the spot that doesn't feel good? Uh, <laughs> can, I, can I find some other spots that are there too that maybe aren't as sensitive and still get benefits from it? It is. So some of the, the basic benefits to start off with, we see that rolling can help improve tissue extensibility. And this can be for a couple of different reasons. So there's there's two leading theories right now as to why foam rolling works. Uh, the first is more of this neurophysiological theory. And what that's going to be is the, the pressure from the roller is going to stimulate the nervous system. And then we know our highly intelligent nervous system is then going to have a response to that pressure. This can be reducing tension or maybe in uh, inhibiting a muscle that's identified as being overactive. One of the other really cool things we see with this research is that that sort of a uh, inhibition effect, if you will, it's not necessarily a only a local response, we see that it has more of a global effect as well. So one of the, uh, a few of the studies that, that we did, we would roll the left quadricep, but we also measured range of motion improvements and uh, changes in, in uh, pain, pain tolerance in the right quadricep. So even though we didn't roll the right quadricep, we're still able to measure or to, to get changes uh, because of this global effect. And that's the neurophysiological response. One of the other things we're seeing is this mechanical response. Now, mechanical, this is going to be when people are talking about uh, breaking up uh, myofascial adhesions and mobilizing tissue. 
there. So that's going to be more of whenever we're just kind of rolling through, we're getting those tissues to, to move. So these, these otherwise sliding surfaces often just become stuck. And just by simply rolling, we're just encouraging some movement between those sliding surfaces. So we have two theories. One is more the nervous system is reducing tension, and the other is more that mechanical force is introducing mobility in between the, the sliding surfaces. Awesome. And, and I wanted to, I know that was a little bit long there, but uh, if we look at that, that's going to support our technique to rolling. So because we need to first influence the nervous system, we're first going to roll slowly through the muscle, identify the most tender spot, and then just hold pressure there. Maybe it's a trigger point. Maybe it's a knot. Maybe it's who knows what. It's a tender spot. Hold pressure. Breathe. Relax. Give the nervous system a chance to adapt and sort of acclimate to that pressure. You may feel a release of tension. And then our next step is to try to add movement. So maybe we're doing a, if you're rolling the quadricep, maybe you perform some knee flexion so we get a pin and stretch. Maybe you just roll up and down slowly, just something to add some movement to the tissues. I love that. I want to I want to get into talking about some of these different techniques. Uh, pin and stretch is something that I feel when I do actual hands-on therapy. Uh, so I, I try to relate that over, but I want to get into some of the different concepts in just a moment. Um, I will say also something really interesting with the neurophysiological effects. We see that in resistance training as well, where um, you might do a bicep curl on one side and it actually increases your ability to do a bicep curl on the other side. Um, and so when, when I train with people, there are oftentimes people want to do, let me just do my bad side first and get it over with. Um, and <laughs> yeah. I actually encourage them to do their dominant side first, the one that they're better at, because neurophysiologically, you can actually teach your non-dominant side a little bit about it so that it's better when you actually do it. So uh, it sounds like foam rolling, the same type of experience that you might have with exercise, you have with foam rolling as well, where you could re uh, release, you could do rolling towards one side and it inhibits the other side to a degree. Is that correct? It, it is. And that would be, you know, one of the, the, reasons we could do that or we may want to do that. Let's say you have an injury on one side, but you still for some reason need to try to, to influence it, but you don't want to roll it. You can roll the other side and it's a, you know, a carryover or a crossover effect because those muscles are innervated at the same spinal segment. So whenever I'm sending those impulses up one side, it carries over to that other side. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, I, I want to reach out to our producer, Greg, who is uh, his on the line with us, and he's accepting questions and wants to read a few out. So, Greg, what do you got for us? Yeah, guys, I appreciate you throwing me in here. Uh, we've got one from David Crow on the chat who says, uh, I've always struggled at what we are doing at the cellular level with foam rolling. At the cellular level, are we sort of quieting down the myofibril blast activity? Are we doing what to the myofibroblast? Are we quieting it down is, is the question. I, I don't know. That is above, <laughs> my, that is above my, my pay grade. <laughs> well, good to know. Uh, so, and then looking at, let me just be clear. What we're looking at is what does the evidence say? Uh, we're not looking at here's, here's a good concept that may or may not be true. Uh, <clears throat> As far as the evidence, um, we don't see anything, uh, and Kyle, and with, with the work that you do, and you've done a lot on this, um, there's no evidence suggesting what's going on on this kind of myofibril blast level that, that you're talking about. Is that right, Kyle? That is right, and I think it's a great, a great point to say that. One of the things with, with foam rolling, um, we have these theories, but we really don't know exactly why it works. So if you look at the research, while the research has has you know ballooned in the past five years or really exploded in the past five years, we're still just working to establish standards. So one of the things uh, Dr. Cheatham and I have done in the past you know ten studies is replicate the same methods, and that's really what we need to establish first. Get people to replicate the same methods, and then we can start to explore those more uh, detailed questions and try to explore it at the cellular level. Because right now the research is all over the board with how they're they're trying to do it. 
Great. Yeah. And then Hannah in the chat wants to know, so the term self-myofascial release, should we not be using that anymore? I think that's a good question, and I have a couple of different perspectives. So in some of our new, or some of NASM's new material, we're going to start using the term self-myofascial rolling. But the term self-myofascial release is well established in the literature. So it's not that that term is wrong. You can still use it. One of the things I try to get fitness professionals to understand, though, is the the changes we're actually making so if you want to use self myofascial release that's completely up to you but understand that we we don't know that we're really releasing the fascia we could be releasing tension we could be releasing i don't know pent up emotions or whatever it is you want to talk about with your client uh so that's really up to the professional it's not that it's wrong to use but we're going to shift some of our terminology to self myofascial rolling I, I want to add to that is that when I first started doing this and uh, I was working with a guy who was one of our educators here at NASM years ago, his name's Eric Beard, and he was a, also a massage therapist and I was not at the time. And I remember him saying, this is technically not self myofascial release because that is a specific technique that includes a type of gliding of the hand, uh, not a rolling technique. So, uh, technique. Um, SMR, the way that we do it, foam rolling, was done to be as close as we could mimic self-myofascial release. And so it was called that, but it's not the same or uh, similar, but not the same type of responses that may be happening when you use self-myofascial release as a hands-on technique. Yeah, excellent, excellent explanation. Um, Greg, do you have another question? And if you do, we'll take it. If not, I've got some, uh, some things I want to hit up. Yeah, we do have one more. Let me pull it up here from, uh, one of our, uh, one of our people in the chat. They want to know, is there a real significant difference on the hard and soft foam roller usage? Uh, and is there any protocol on what to follow? That's an excellent question. And uh, as of right now, I believe Dr. Cheatham and I are the only ones to, to do a study exploring the different densities. We took three different densities. One was softer than the other two. But as far as, you know, quantifying what does soft mean, nobody's really done that before. But we threw three different densities, a soft, a medium and a hard. And we found the best responses on the the roller that we had classified as a medium density. On the hard density, you know, oftentimes, and I, I've said this for years, we often said that, you know, something that's a little bit more dense is going to influence more layers of tissue, and it may be more impactful or more effective. However, what we see is it hurts. And if it hurts, most of our subjects, we use college, uh, college athletes, most of our subjects would tense up against it. So we, get, we got the best response on the medium density. The second best response was on the soft density. However, I think uh, the real take home point from our study, though, is the it's personal preference. So the most effective roller is the one that the client will use. I, I suggest that everyone start off with the softest thing you can find, especially if it's the first time for a client to roll. Get the softest pull, pull noodle you can find and just explore and see how do they like that? Is it you know, does it do they want more? Is it too much? And then you can slowly progress to the the uh, more dense rollers over time, if they need. If they don't need it, don't do it. Nice. Good. I love that. That was a great question. Thanks for asking that. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there that are very pleased with that answer. <laughs> um, you know, when teaching different courses, I would see people doing these foam rolling things and they might do the most advanced looking foam rolling thing. And we're not, we're not doing it, but they're doing it because they want to show how good they are at foam rolling. Um, and one of the things that I find to be pretty interesting, especially things like if you're doing the vastus lateralis, so right along the IT band, and people will lift up and put their entire body weight on. And the majority of people that are doing that uh, are absolutely contracting their BL. So they're tightening their quad. So I, I think that almost anybody could tighten their quad really tight and get on a foam roller and not accomplish anything. So it's not that you can do that. It's yeah. getting anything out of doing that. And so um, 
Can you speak a little bit to, because you mentioned it before, the the breathing into it, trying to relax, trying to maybe, is that our attempt at getting an, an, a, a, a sympathetic nervous system response during this kind of point of pressure stress? Yeah, for sure. So really on that, on that last, that last point, if we're, if our goal is to use rolling to try to reduce tension or inhibit a muscle, because we can have uh, different goals in our, with our rolling strategies. Um, if that's our goal, then breathing is going to be a, a vital aspect of that. So we would, we would focus on the deep diaphragmatic breathing again, trying to engage that parasympathetic response to try to just down regulate the nervous system. And uh, one of the things that I often hear people say is, well, pre-exercise, why would I want to try to induce or engage this relaxation response? But one of the things that, that I encourage people to think is, if we look at the average person, the average client, they, they go to a job they probably don't like that much, uh, maybe not right now, but they usually go to a job that they don't necessarily love. They're probably hi hyped up on caffeine, and they probably listen to some kind of an angry song on their way to the gym. So there's nothing wrong with taking a few minutes to just kind of calm down, roll slowly, breathe, relax, deep diaphragmatic breaths to try to engage that parasympathetic uh, response. And one of the things we don't want is somebody holding their breath or somebody getting that rapid breathing to try to you know, engage more of the, the sympathetic response. Um, if you notice somebody holding their breath, that's typically going to be a stress response. And we either want to make sure we're cueing the breathing or get them a softer roller, something that they that doesn't hurt quite so bad. Um, so let's get into a couple of other things where we talk about uh, protocols for, for foam rolling. I know that uh, oftentimes, NASM, we, we will oftentimes get people on a more remedial level to, I, I would tell people, uh, foam rolling uh, is probably yes. unfortunate misnomer because they're, the first thing people do when you get it is they roll around on it like they're trying to start a fire. Um, <laughs> what's one of the ways that you know, we would try to get people to find a tender spot and stay there um, the, the research isn't limited to that being a benefit or an outcome, though. Uh, it is beneficial. It does help to, to reduce the tonicity in that area. But there are other techniques that are out there that are also beneficial. So what are some of those other things that, that can be beneficial? One of the most often used techniques, if we want to call it that, in the research is just to roll. And the reason is because they can set a metronome, they can set a timer, and they can control that component of the research. They can make sure somebody is rolling at a specific pace for 60 seconds, and then they can measure the outcomes. So because of that, uh, people think, and, and these are you know intelligent people that read the research, uh, they believe that just rolling is what we would do because that's what they do in the research. However, they're kind of missing that component of, well, that's the, the reason they do that in the studies is because of the trying to control it. Um, so that is a technique though. It shows that just rolling back and forth actually works. The changes don't last that long, but there's been studies where they roll at an incredibly quick pace for only 10 seconds and then measure improvements in uh, tissue extensibility and range of motion. The theories behind that is the super quick rolling is creating friction and heat, and that's what's, that's what's you know improving the, the extensibility. Uh, however, if we take a look at, in my opinion, if we take a look at the the intent, the goals, and all the research collectively, we would want to start easy, start slowly, identifying that tender spot. And one of the reasons they don't do that too much in the research is because it takes a special person to come in there, and a, a therapist, and actually identify this is the tender spot, mark it, hold your roller here. It's just an added step that creates complexity in the research. However, looking at the techniques, remember, we kind of just need to calm people down. Let's do a slow roll. Let's find a tender spot, hold, breathe, relax, 30 to 60 seconds or until you feel a release. And then after that, do something that includes movement. If it's a new client, I would just have the client roll. Nice slow roll after they hold pressure, get some, some fluid flow, some tissues to move in, all that fun stuff. 
if it's a more advanced client, maybe you have them do something like some uh, uh, dorsiflexion or some toe taps or something if they're rolling the, the ankle or if they're rolling their glute piriformis, have them go through some knee flexions. Or maybe you could even do like a cross friction. If this is the roller and my legs on top of it, just do a little shift side to side. Again, just trying to add that mobility to the tissues. Um, you mentioned the the length. Of, how long these last? Now I know that you know some of the benefits of it. People can can foam roll and then work out. So you've spoken to that. Uh, but but let's say that we're doing it for the purposes of flexibility for range of motion. If I do a foam rolling session and you know in the most optimized way. Uh, whatever that is, and you can speak to that at least of uh, what, what you see as being the most optimized utilization of how to foam roll and how long do those benefits last? The, the results of your foam rolling, how long they last depends on what you do after foam rolling. So if you roll a muscle and then you get up and you, you roll your quadricep and then you go over to the knee extension, well, your results of the foam rolling aren't really going to last very long. However, if you follow, if your goal is to improve flexibility or tissue extensibility or joint range of motion, if you follow some sort of a, a process, so you roll to influence the nervous system, to create some tissue mobility. If you then go into some sort of a stretch, again, just further trying to uh, improve ex extensibility by influencing uh, stretch tolerance, that's going to make the results last longer than rolling alone. So if we look at the, the research, it really lasts anywhere from uh, a couple of minutes up to, I believe, 10 I believe 10 to 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes is the, the longest they've ever measured the results of foam rolling lasting. I may be a little bit off on that number, but it's not that it, it doesn't last a really long period of time. It's really a short window there uh, to where we can try to use that new mobility to, if we're following a corrective exercise program, for example, we would then activate muscles on the other side of the joint, and then we would perform a total body movement to try to you know, teach the body what to do with this newfound mobility and and stability. So it really just depends. It's variable. It depends on what you do. I don't think that was a very good answer. Uh, I, I, I thought it was decent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was fine. Uh, no, that, that, that is the answer. Uh, I know that Greg has been fielding a few more questions. So if you don't mind, Greg, go ahead and, and throw some out to us. Yeah. Bill in the chat wants to know any recommendations for clients who cannot get on the floor or lift their own body weight? Yes. So one of the first things I tell people is remember that this is this stems from massage. So if you have a client that has a whole host of chronic conditions or injuries or you know something, refer them out to a great therapist. Um, however, for a client that just can't get on the ground, we can use a bench. So if you're rolling the, the lower extremities, the calves or whatever, have them sit on a bench, put the roller on the other side and throw the leg over top of it. If they're trying to get to the upper body, they can lean up against the wall. Um, a big part of this is relaxation. So if they're having to support their, their body weight by trying to roll something up against the wall, it may not be the exact same response as if they were on the ground where they could literally just lay there and relax, but they will still get uh, benefits from the techniques. Also the handheld rollers. Um, all the companies are making them these days. They can sit, they can roll. A again, in my opinion, using body weight gives you a little bit more of an advantage, but if the client can't do it, then, then get one of those handheld rollers, put them up against the wall. Uh, all those techniques work. Um, and Greg, I think uh, we got another one. Go ahead and let us know. Nope. Yeah, so Scott in the chat wants to know what uh, what level of pain should you actually try to achieve while you're going through this uh, on a scale of 1 to 10 is, is what he's interested in. 1 to 10? 12. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it really depends. So there's been some interesting uh, research out there, too, that look at a, a pain scale. And one of the studies, they used a handheld roller, and they found that pressing so hard to, to reach a level eight on a scale of one to ten got them the most benefits. But 
to me, in my opinion, that goes, that's a little bit extreme. The, the goal of this is not necessarily to induce pain. So I try to use that word discomfort more than pain. And it, it can be anywhere from, you know, depends on the person. Uh, generally say somewhere between a five, six or a seven, that's going to be kind of that higher end. If you start to get to the eight to 10, it may be a little bit too much pain to actually re- relax. If you start to get to the lower end, so if it's a zero, one or two, it may not be enough to induce a response. Not that it's wrong. You know, if you're if your client rolls down there at a one and that's what they enjoy, then stick with it. But we may need a little bit more pressure to try to induce that response. So to answer the question between a five to seven, maybe at eight uh, as a maximum. And that is if the client is accustomed to rolling and they know what they're doing. What do you think about that, Rick? I think that some people like that pain. And if you can get to an eight and you can relax in that position, that's a big part of it. And and I use uh, oftentimes um, uh, there are body cues that people give to let you know that they're not relaxing. So when people are rolling their calves, they'll do a hard dorsiflex. So try to keep the, the, the ankle relaxed. When people are foam rolling their quads and they're holding themselves up, their white knuckled fist as they're holding it, I know you're not relaxing. I know you're not taking a breath. So if if you can get to that point of eight on that scale, right? So still relax in is a cue that I give to people um, that usually that are personal trainers uh, teaching workshops, but also letting them know that that may not be where your clients are. So you can't put your clients in pain, just like lifting weights. You can't put them in pain and expect them to keep coming back to you. Um, And and the other thing too, is you have to have uh, a really solid rationale as to why you do foam rolling. Um, Because some people will see it as painful. Some people will see it as a waste of their money, right? They came to work out with you and you to to do workouts. And then here we are rolling around uh, on the floor on top of these things. So um, let me just let me pass that over to you, Kyle. What are what are some of the things when you just say, hey, when talking to to people about the reasons why they should foam roll, just give us the the short list of what trainers can use to explain that to their clients. Well, I think it depends on how you you start a client. One of the the you know what we use at in ASM looking at the uh, the movement assessments, right? So if you first start off with a client and you you go through their their medical history and all that fun stuff, but then you go to a movement assessment, and if you're able to identify you know some sort of a movement compensation, that to me is the first selling point to foam rolling because we can identify this you know less than optimal pattern, whatever it may be, um, put them down on a roller for a few seconds, they get up and they automatically move better so it's really not even words that we would we would exchange we could just show them through their actions hey do you feel how your your uh, ankle feels a little bit better moves a little bit better after rolling if we if we target you know four or five muscle groups your entire body is going to feel and move better and it's going to help us get to your goals quicker um, another quick one too if people don't want to get on the ground and roll just have them like rolling the bottom of the foot again throw you know whatever kind of tennis ball or whatever you have down there roll the bottom of the foot for 30 to 45 seconds have them walk around and again immediately they feel the difference so I think those feelings speak a lot more than words. If we're if we if we're left with having to try to talk through it, it's going to help with flexibility. It's going to help them feel better, move better, function better, and ultimately reach their goals quicker. Great, I love that because we're kind of talking about who should be foam rolling. Um, can you speak maybe a little bit to who should not be foam rolling? What are what are some maybe some populations or situations where foam rolling might be off the table for people? There, so that's one of the things that's never really been investigated with foam rolling specifically. So we base our recommendations off of general uh, massage precautions and contraindications, and it's going to be you know obviously anybody with uh, or looking at anybody that has any sort of of like diabetes or anybody that has a blood flow restriction, blood flow problems, 
those, I don't know, circulation, circulatory problems. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, so things there, looking at things like uh, uh, pregnant clients, we know that, you know, there's pressure points in the body that can induce contraction. So being careful there. And the the main recommendation is if if any client has something that you're not comfortable with or if they're not comfortable foam rolling for whatever reason, refer them out. Uh, make sure they go talk to their, their physician about it first. You know, they can cover some of the aspects of foam rolling with their physician. And then if it's approved, then, then they can roll. Uh, back to the original question, though, the list of precautions and contraindications is, is quite extensive. So I would take a look at our textbook or the study. Dr. Cheatham and I recently published the clinical commentary in the Journal of Sports Physical Therapy, uh, where we cover the precautions and contraindications. Really super nerdy. Thanks for sharing. Uh, let's, let's go into uh, a couple other things. Um, well, well, just let me speak to it real quick. Uh, acutely with foam rolling, just so I share this with people, they're kind of a, a four-part process when you're rolling something and acutely something is felt, when you should get off of that point. And I always tell people if it pulses, numbs, tingles, or shoots, you got to get off of it. So pulsing, numbing, tingling, or shooting is probably indicating that you're either on a blood supply or you're on a nerve. And neither one, we're not looking for, for neural release or blood flow occlusion necessarily. We are looking for a type of, of either a neurophysiological or a mechanical response within the, the muscle or within the nervous system, but not put pressure directly on those larger nerves. So if you feel it, pulsing now while you're shooting and off, off of that move point you probably won't have to go far in order to get off of that but there are some places that that is very um that that i would say would be contraindicated now uh kyle i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up a few things let's just say a, a a what i'll call a regular foam roller it's got some ridges um and then we've got these things that have buttons on it and you push and they turn on and they vibrate and uh we've seen a kind of a proliferation of foam rollers that have this vibration technology. Um, can you speak to that? Is there anything validated with the vibration technology that's been added into this foam rolling process? Yes, for sure. Um, and I, I'm sure there's been updated studies the past couple of months that I'm not aware of. So if anybody out there knows all the updated uh, vibration research, then I apologize uh, if I say something that that is contradictory to what has come out recently. Um, so we published one of the first studies on this back in 2017. And one of the big things we found is that vibration influenced the perception of pain. So we would do pain pressure threshold or we take this cool little plunger and then just drive it down into the quad. And then whenever the person says, ow, we, we read that and then we would roll and then see where they say, ow, again, we see that uh, vibration immediately reduces that perception of pain. So it increases your pain tolerance has a significant impact on that. We did not find big changes in uh, range of motion or you know improvements in, in muscle flexibility. We saw small changes there, but not enough to be uh, st statistically significant. So we look at it from a pain perspective, and it's basically if we take you know we have these cool receptors they can they can sense pain or they can sense movement, but not both at the same time. So if something is painful and we introduce movement, it essentially turns down the volume on the pain response. And we see that that kind of buys us a window of opportunity. So if we have whatever the pain is, we won't get into those details. You use the vibration foam roller on it. We can reduce the perception of pain. We can then introduce better movement patterns or maybe flexibility techniques or something along those lines that will help us to, to have a, a longer lasting response on, on pain or discomfort. We have, a, we have something called the gate theory of pain. It sounds like that's what uh, that attenuation process is probably relying on. Um, mm -hmm. Just uh, not too long ago, I'd taken my, my four-year-old to, to go get shots. And the, the doctor had this little, little pad that she slid through her finger. And the pad had all these tiny little spikes on it. And then there was a hole in it. And she placed it on his shoulder. 
and then she took a needle and went in and gave him the shot. And then he didn't cry, he didn't feel anything. He didn't even notice that that shot was taking place. Um, I think it's probably a similar process. That's the gate theory of pain, which means we get a new, um, numerous kind of inputs that are put into our system and the gates close. So the nervous system can only receive so much information from a particular area and those gates may close. And so um, from what you're talking about, it seems like there's the, the gate theory of pain is being activated right there. So sensations are being created that other sensations cannot be received. And thank goodness they're the sensations of pain. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the ways we would use that, I was just thinking, let's say you have a client that's either new to rolling or it's an existing client and an area is typically very uncomfortable, but they need to address it. If you take the vibrating roller, IT band, vastus lateralis, for example, you take the vibrating roller, that little vibration is going to make it not as uncomfortable to roll that particular area of the body. That means that the client would likely spend a little bit longer on it and they that will get them a better result in most cases. So that's one way we can use that vibration technology. Nice, I like that. Um, let me also speak to uh, pain in regard to, to foam rolling. And we, we know that, that this feeling that the pressure is mass time surface area. And so when you have a smaller roller, maybe something like this thing, it's much smaller, so it's got less surface area. It's gonna be more pressure into the body. Um, a lot of people will have rollers that are about this size. And so one of the things, if you have, are limited to this, and it is a, it's a firm roller that's here, um, some gyms have more than one foam roller. So what I suggest is if you're doing that area, like the vastus lateral, or two rollers. And so now what I've done is I've doubled the surface area therefore cutting in half the amount of pressure that I'm receiving and I'm spreading it out over more locations. So I'm getting um, two areas, I guess you could say, of release, but I don't have nearly as much pressure in any one place and it can create, it can make it more tolerable for people who find it to be pretty painful. So yeah. that's, a, that's a nice addition to, to add into it. Uh, let me go to, to Greg. Do, Greg, do we have any more questions that we want to get answered? And then um, I'll do an extra wrap it up and and things like that. Yeah, Barbie in the chat wants to know uh, kind of a clarification to things. So uh, you roll before workout to help with overactive muscles for better movement, and then do you roll after uh, a workout for flexibility reasons? Is that kind of the way it works? Uh, that's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked. So yes, before we want to roll to try to improve range of motion where it needs it, that's going to improve our movement patterns. It should lead to a better workout, may even reduce our chances of injury during that workout or athletic event. Post-exercise, I recommend a different approach. Post-exercise, we're really trying to, to flush out the, the metabolic waste from the muscles that work the most, uh, especially if our goal or if we did a workout that would induce soreness, let's try to squish or push out, uh, again, some of that metabolic waste. So then, ideally, we would roll at least the muscles that did the most work, but this would be more of just a continual slow rolling process. So kind of just flushing out the tissue. And the idea there again is uh, some of the molecules that are associated with this metabolic waste are rather large and they don't easily flush themselves out. So taking that pressure and squeezing, and there's some really cool devices these days that do that with air, taking that and squeezing and trying to push some of that stuff out is going to help speed up the recovery process. And uh, several studies have proven this with rolling, those that roll after uh, DOMS inducing exercise, they still get sore, but the soreness, they don't get quite as sore and it peaks quicker than those that don't roll afterwards. So you can get back into the gym or to, back to your uh, athletic event sooner if you roll after a workout. Just a quick question, because I know that some people are out there thinking it. It may not be your area of study or area of focus, but let me throw one more tool into the, the device pan here. We've got these, uh, these different, and, and they're numerous on, on the market right now, but these are the, the percussion therapy, um, and there's, uh, in some instances, a fine line between what percussion and what vibration is. Um, but 
it's not foam rolling. It is, it's, it's similar, I would assume, in many ways, but do you have any, uh, any education content, any support on that? Um, I know that there have been no studies yet. There are two that I'm aware of that are being conducted. Uh, Hyperice is doing one with, uh, it's a university in Hawaii, but I can't remember. I think it's BYU, but the Hawaii campus. Uh, they've, they've begun a, a, a study out there to find out. Um, and a colleague, Dr. Cheatham, he is putting together a little bit of a review. So he's trying to, to gather some initial information on proper uses or how clinicians are using them out there. So he's kind of working on a study as well. Um, it's not my area of expertise. The theories, as I understand it, and I'm sure I would, I would love to hear yours as well. The, it is a fine line between vibration and percussion. Like what is it, what is it doing? Percussion would be more, you know, driving against the tissues. And that pressure into the tissue is going to create more of a, a rapid and a frequent lengthening response in the muscle itself, the, in the tendon, the, the same mechanoreceptors that we, we talk about all the time with flexibility and rolling and all that. And that could induce a response in itself, whether it's inhibitory or excitatory. I don't quite know yet, but that would be the results of a percussive device. The way I use mine, which is sitting over here by my desk, is more from a vibration perspective. I will take and put it here, or at least in my, my head, I'm thinking uh, just the vibration response of trying to uh, kind of inhibit pain in actually my left shoulder is my problematic shoulder. I will use it to inhibit pain before workout, so that way I can get better range of motion. I can move better and feel a little bit better. Uh, that is my knowledge of it and the way I would describe it. What do you think? I like what you said. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, have, uh, I think that theoretically we're looking at similar processes that you see with flexibility training where we're trying to get that, that um, inhibitory response after uh, extreme excitement. So overexcite, 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 I'm too excited, I can't, I have to relax. So it's kind of this potentially a neurological fatigue or a neuro neurological response to being overstimulated. Um, is that empirical? Uh, it's not. It's anecdotal. It's not even anecdotal. Um, anecdotally, it, it, you do receive kind of, or I receive and with my clients, um, a means of um, greater range of motion, more comfort through their end ranges of motion. But do we know what's going on? I, I don't know yet. I don't know what that physiological process is. But uh, theoretically, we're looking at similar responses with, with the stretch response. When you use it, do you typically hold over a muscle, or do you just kind of go up and down the same muscle? How do you how do you use it? If you don't mind me asking, that's a that's a good question. I will explore first, so I kind of just move around an area, um, and then when I find an area that I'm like, oh my gosh, it's, I mean, it's kind of like massage. You find an area, and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, 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 kid, stay there, don't stop, uh, just because I'm crying. Uh, I don't want you to get off of it. I want you to stay right there. Uh, so I'll find a spot and then work around that spot. I'll work on that area and I'll work around that area. But once I find one of those tender areas, I generally uh, stay pretty focused on that until it's time to move on to the next one. So again, it may be 30, 45 seconds, a minute, um, and then and then continue going through my search process. Do you have the pressure monitor on yours? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This one does. Do you ever go in, do you ever use that? Do you go hardcore? Do you start to stay easy or light? Um, I usually don't push too hard into it. I might get up to that second dot sometimes. Um, yeah. I also rarely ever go up. The one I'm using, I, I use the Hypervolt. And that's, that's just my personal preference. Uh, I use the Hypervolt and I rarely ever go to the third level on it. Uh, I'm usually on that level one or level two, and I don't push too much into it because sometimes I feel when I push deeper into it, it minimizes the ability to actually create percussion. It's like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm stifling it versus being able to get that actual percussion into it. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. All right. So real quick, uh, Greg, do we have anything else that we uh, that that people are chomping at the bit to, to get answers for well we got Kyle still on the line yeah Christine wants to know which direction do you roll to flush out is it only uh, up or downward toward the feet does it matter uh, the direction 
Uh, great, great question. In my experience, in my opinion, it it doesn't matter. So we can roll up and down. One of the things I encourage you to to do is develop some sort of a of a system or a technique and stick with it. So that way your clients get the same thing each time. So one of the things I did is I start by rolling at the feet, and at least my first roll will be upwards or towards the heart or whatever we want to call it. Uh, so I always start at the feet and then come up. However, if we're doing a flushing technique, I will just to continue rolling up and down. I don't reposition it at the feet each time and, and try to come up. So I start at the feet for consistency and work up the body, but you can, you can roll back and forth. I've had massage therapists get very mad at me for saying that, but uh, based on my experience and the information available, there's nothing to suggest that we cannot do it that way. Uh, let me go into just a little bit of background as to why that information from distal or proximal had, had come about, which is because the lymphatic drainage sites uh, always move from distal to proximal. So when, when you're, you're flushing out the lymph, um, it's always a distal to proximal um, um, stroke. And, and they're tiny. They're really, really, when people do lymphatic drainage, it's really, really, I mean, tiny, light strokes that, that push up. And they go into what they're, what they're called watersheds. So these, these lymphatic sites that absorb and take it out of this, uh, this extracellular fluid that starts to build up. Um, if I've got somebody that has real lymphatic issues, then I'd, I'd be a little more careful with any of the distal, uh, any of the proximal to distal, meaning starting at the top of the leg and moving towards the bottom of the leg. However, it's, it's kind of like, kind of like, you know, salt in your diet can, if, if you don't have heart disease, then you can have some okay for you because your body's not adverse to it. It's, it's not a contraindication for you. Um, if it is a contraindication potentially, then you would only want to really focus on that distal towards proximal, meaning starting maybe at the foot and ankle on the calf and moving up towards the top of the leg versus um, starting at the knee and moving down towards uh, the calf. So just something to think about. Um, and, and there's rationale why I think a lot of people, as you mentioned, Kyle, who get upset, have no idea why they're upset. They have no idea. It's a, it's a lot of times, uh, things and techniques that people learn. It's like religion. Sometimes we just don't know why, but we're really connected to it. Uh, and we get defensive when people question it. So what I think we should do, and, and I'm a religious person, so I'm not trying to take anything away from it, but I think defending things that we don't understand, we have to care for, be careful about how angry we get uh, when it comes to those things. So if you have great rationale, you have a clear understanding of why you do what you do, and somebody is up there that says, I didn't, it doesn't really matter, then you have your own system and you can follow that system, but have a clear understanding, not just what it is, but always compare that back to the evidence and not just to um, a dogma or a thought process that surrounds your ideas. Excellent suggestion. Um, Greg, anything else before we wrap up? No, that was it in terms of uh, the questions that I think we have time to get to. But uh, just a little housekeeping. Want to remind everybody uh, if if these to if the uh, top this topic or, or things similar to this interests you, make sure check out our new and improved uh, corrective exercise specialization that is available at nasm.org. The link is also in the post and in the chat. Make sure to to check that out and uh, and make sure to join us again tomorrow as we will have our trainer roundtable here on Facebook Live uh, at noon Pacific time. And then Rick will be back on Friday with another, uh, uh, another version of NASM Live as well. Perfect. Well, I want to say thank you for everybody who, who tuned into this and who are participating. I appreciate all the questions. Uh, and then a huge amount of gratitude, a thank you to uh, Dr. Kyle Stoll, who, as Greg mentioned, the, the new corrective exercise program that has been put together, Kyle was a huge uh, part of 
uh, developing content, uh, a massive subject matter expert who put a lot of information into this, did a lot of editing on it, did a lot of review. So thank you for today and thank you for all that you do for NASM. I also, before we wrap up, I wanna uh, point you to Kyle's book because he won't. Uh, the book is called The Complete Guide to Foam Rolling, Increase Flexibility and Mobility, Enhance Recovery, Minimize Injury, Optimized Performance by Kyle Stoll. Check out the complete guide to foam rolling wherever you buy books. <laughs> so Kyle, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. As always, it was a, a pleasure hanging out with you, Rick. Pleasure, my friend. Good to see you.